about what what is classified as separate property and what is classified as marital property and what may make separate property in you know marital property you need to always keep that in mind um, you know and that's just good with you know your general estate planning or or your general you know it goes back to the prenuptial agreement if that's something you've signed um, it, it's good to just keep those things in mind um, when going through your marriage um, in case a divorce unfortunately comes your way and one thing that I often uh, talk to my clients about is really what we're fighting over when we're having this fight over separate versus marital property is half of whatever it is we're talking about because if you've got fifty thousand dollars that you inherited from your grandmother and we're arguing that it's separate and your spouse is arguing that it's marital under their theory you're going to get twenty five thousand and she's going to get twenty five thousand yes under under our theory you're going to get fifty thousand so the fight we're having is over that second half half of it's still going to be yours we're trying to preserve the whole thing most certainly and, and again you know my my biggest words of wisdom is think about if you do have separate property or, or you're listening to this and you do have inherited property think about what you're doing with that and and, and consult an attorney um, with regard to what makes separate property marital property now moving on to point four be prepared to negotiate um, we're talking about I think the the big key to this particular paragraph uh, is um, the differences between negotiating for property you want to keep and property you're willing to let go. Kim, you want to <laughs> talk and, about that? And I think a lot of times it's helpful to sit down and, and figure out what are the two or three most important things for you to get out of the case. And if you can preserve those two or three things, then you can feel successful. That's one of the problems that people have, I think, when they negotiate something. Because we go through these things piecemeal, they feel like they're always giving on, on things. And I, that's why it's helpful, I think, to have a list of what are the two or three most important things to you and know that if you can be successful on those two or three things, then you can feel like maybe you were, you were successful in the process. But you know, I think a, a good example, going back to the small business that, that we've been talking about a lot, most of the time, the court's not going to award half the business to your spouse. What they're going to do is order you to buy her out for half the value of the business. Right. That's an example of where you're going to maybe be able to negotiate or set aside different assets. You want to keep this business, so what are you willing to give her so that she'll give you that interest in the business? The typical example that we see, and I think I talked about this in the article, is uh, one spouse really wants to keep the house. Um, and oftentimes that's uh, the wife that wants to keep the house and wants to keep the kids in the school district where they are. And so keeping the house is really important to them. There's equity in the house, but they can't afford a higher mortgage, and they can't afford to write a check for half the value of that equity. On the flip side, my client has this retirement account. We've already talked about how emotional that can be. So they want to keep this retirement account. Well, that's a situation where we, we may be able to negotiate a set-off. She keeps the house and the equity. You keep a larger portion of the retirement account, and then everybody gets what they, they most wanted out of that arrangement. So you think about things like that where you can find things that you think she wants to set off against the things that you want. One word of caution, if you're dealing with using the retirement account as a set off, though, uh, there are tax implications with the retirement account. Those are usually tax deferred assets. So just because there's $100,000 gross value in your 401k doesn't mean that's what it's worth because when you retire, you're going to have to pay taxes on that. So it might only be worth sixty or 70000 in your pocket right and, and it's it's and real mer money versus uh out there money money that you that is not fully realized yet that's right and so you want to you want to talk to a, a, a good domestic attorney about should we be tax what i call tax treating this money or reducing it for the impact that taxes are going to play so that we have a more realistic picture of what it's worth versus uh, the, uh, the hard assets you might call that this that your spouse is going to get right and and you know this is I don't mean to be Debbie Downer here, but something to think about too is with regard to that retirement account, is it going to be there when you retire? I mean, we all hear horror stories of um, companies going under and not having protection as their retirement accounts. And so, you know, it, it, you do have to do a little bit of thinking ahead whenever you are going through these divorce cases. And, and you know, I, I wouldn't say to use the worst case possible, but, you know, if you are giving her the house or, you know, you're trading the house for your retirement account, you know, are, are you for sure that it's going to be there? Are you for sure that, you know, she's getting an asset and you're going to get an asset as well? Again, I think those are rare cases, but definitely something to think about. Absolutely. You're 
essentially giving up the tangible for the expectations of the future. And uh, so you should be considering that risk. I think one thing that's important, you know, to keep in mind is as you're going through the process, the court is going to view the assets that have come into this marriage, generally speaking, as marital, subject to division. Um, and so regardless of how emotionally attached you may be to the retirement account of your small business, I think you need to go into the process with your eyes open knowing that the court is not likely to say, well, you just keep that and we won't worry about it. The court is going to want to take that into account for dividing uh, in terms of the divorce. So you need to be thinking about what you can do to get the best outcome possible, knowing that you're probably not going to get everything that you want. I, I think that's good. And I think what's important, and I try to do this with all of my clients, is sit them down at the beginning, even though sometimes at the beginning of a case, things aren't as clear as they are at the end of the case as to assets and debts and whatnot. I do sit down with my clients and say, okay, what are your goals for the case? What if you could have what you want out of this case, you know, like, like Ken mentioned, you know, ranking or prioritizing what they would like to get out of the case, you know, saying what's really important for you to keep and what are, what are some throwaway things? I'm not going to mention this to opposing party. I'm not going to mention this to opposing counsel. But what can you live with and what can you live without? Yeah, I think that's a great approach because it, you do get bogged down in the details of these back and forth and you feel like you're giving on this issue and that issue. And so it's real helpful if you can remember, well, those are issues that weren't important to me anyway. And these are the big things that were important to me and we've, we've protected them. Um, I think the other thing that you know we've kind of touched on throughout our conversation, a lot of these assets and debts are things that we can say pretty well are going to be set aside to one party or the other. The court doesn't have to divide everything in half. <laughs> Oh, you mean like all the kitchen chairs? They don't exactly. have to divide that? <laughs> exactly. Or the debt that you owe to your parents because you had to borrow money. You're probably going to have to pay that debt back. But what the court will probably do is put together a spreadsheet that shows you're taking that $10,000 debt to your parents. Assuming, again, going back to proof, you have to be able to prove that you actually borrowed that money and used it for marital purposes. But if you can do that, you're going to be the one who pays it back. Mm -hmm. But it's probably going to end up on that spreadsheet somewhere. And so the overall distribution is going to be hopefully equal. It doesn't mean that every asset and debt has to be equally divided. Right. And I think something interesting that you touched on and very important is you have to remember, you know, the most people when going through a divorce, they don't have a lot of extra cash lying around. You know, we're we're dealing with people that don't don't have a lot and especially, you know, divorce is a trying time on people both emotionally and financially. So you also need to think about when planning or when strategizing with your attorney about who's going to get what and how do you buy one another out is a lot of people don't have large sums of money per se to buy the other, the other spouse out of you know certain you know their interest in a 401k or their interest in the house so what Ken had mentioned before and I think is a really good point is you have to think you know kind of creatively or outside the box hey if she takes the house because I can't buy her out of my portion or she can't pay me an equity payment then in essence we're trading the 401k for the house and no money is exchanged I mean hypothetical money is exchanged but that's a way to get around things because having a money judgment is a good thing but if the other party doesn't have the money to pay you you can't you can't get money where there is no money <laughs> and I think what highlights that is you know we all know that at least those of us that that are in this line of work know the number one thing that leads to divorces are financial problems most certainly I think th I so and I, I think that's what what definitely is the catalyst for a lot of these divorces and so you're you're dealing with people that are probably in some sort of some level of financial distress, that's why we're where we are now, and that makes it even more likely that there's not that pile of money sitting around to write the big check. Right, right. And, and again, you know, you, that is something you need to be planning for or thinking about. If you do have a, a large asset and you know that there's not a lot of assets to offset it, you know, who can you borrow the money from or, or, or what can you do with your spouse or come to some kind of an agreement where you can get that, get, get that money some way, somehow. Otherwise, the court's going to do what the court, you know, has to do with regard to assets and, and splitting them up depending upon the facts of your case. That's right. Um, to read this article by Ken McRae and articles like this one, please go to dadsdivorce.com. Uh, thank you for joining us today, and please tune in next week for another edition of Dad's Divorce Live. Thank you, and have a nice day.